Francis Bacon and his Rosicrucian brother Ben Johnson, their hidden relationship. For the last 400 years, the biographers of Francis Bacon and Ben Johnson, putting aside the ignorance of some of them, have suppressed, obscured, downplayed or simply ignored their critical historical relationship, especially in relation to the secret true authorship of the Shakespeare First Folio. Why is their relationship almost completely unknown outside of Baconian circles? Many academics are unsure as to whether the two men even knew each other at all, let alone had a close personal and professional relationship that went back many years. Some commentators even put forward Ben Johnson as the corroborating link that proves the man from Stratford wrote the plays. And here lies the rub. Ben Johnson will be forever connected with the Shakespeare First Folio, which is why Bacon, being a close personal friend of his, presents a very real problem to orthodox scholars regarding the Shakespeare authorship. Well known to Baconians, there exist some very revealing and touching words from a notoriously cantankerous Ben Johnson regarding his friend Francis Bacon. Johnson's thoughts were documented in his Timberall Discoveries, printed posthumously in 1641. Johnson on Bacon's humour and captivating oratory. No man had their affections more in his power. The fear of every man that heard him was lest he should make an end. Johnson on Bacon's supremacy as a dramatist and poet. Now things daily fall, wits grow downward and eloquence grows backward, so, so that he may be named and stand as the mark and acme of our language. Johnson on Bacon's greatness. In his adversity, I ever prayed that God would give him strength for greatness he could not want. Praise indeed and indicative of a very close personal and professional relationship. As we shall see, there are many more examples of both their relationship and their connections to the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. This systematic suppression of the full truth of the relationship between Francis Bacon and Ben Johnson began with Bacon's first Rosicrucian editor and biographer, Dr Rawley. And aside from the odd vague hint here and there, this studious concealment continued through to his great editor and biographer James Spedding's still standard 14 volume Life and Works of Francis Bacon, all the way down to the standard single volume The Troubled Life of Francis Bacon by Professors Lisa Jardine and Alan Stewart and the entry for his life in the ODNB. This is similarly mirrored in the Ben Jonson editorial and biographical canons, which when read and examined might leave the unknowing reader with the idea that Ben Jonson and Francis Bacon simply did not know each other, or only scarcely knew each other, and anyway their relationship could not have been that important as it would have been written large across these biographical canvases. It is not known at precisely what date Bacon and Johnson became known to each other and how their intimate relationship in later life, one of mutual love and respect, developed. Their paths would almost certainly have crossed in the London theatre world during the early 1590s or in the convivial atmosphere of Gray's Inn where Bacon put on plays, masks and grand entertainments, the most famous being the Christmas Gray's Inn Revels 1594-5. In his edition of the so-called Northumberland Manuscript, its editor, F.J. Burgoyne, wondered if Ben Jonson was part of Bacon's scriptorium or literary workshop during the 1590s. This likelihood was taken up in Ben Jonson, A Life, wherein Professor Donaldson states that Burgoyne's conjecture can be supported by a number of contextual considerations. He cites the passage in Discoveries, where Johnson says of Bacon, Within his view and about his times were all the wits born that could honour a language or help study, about which Professor Donaldson observes, Johnson is clearly referring here not simply to Bacon as an individual, but also to the remarkable intellectual group that was gathered around him during an earlier historical period. This sounds very much like a nostalgic personal recollection of the Bacon-Essex circle of the late 1590s.
On the evidential grounds of Bacon's collection of manuscripts known as the Northumberland Manuscript, which dates no later than 1596-97, it is clear that by then Ben Jonson was moving in the orbit of the Bacon-Essex Circle, operating out of Essex House on the Strand, and that Jonson was associated with Bacon and his literary workshop, with the two of them involved in the production and the performance of arguably the most notorious play in the Elizabethan era. On the much scribbled outer cover of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, formerly known as the Northumberland manuscript, appears the entry Isle of Dogs by Thomas Nash. The notorious play The Isle of Dogs was performed by the Pembroke's men at the Swan Theatre in July 1597, and the subsequent reaction of the authorities to it was swift and severe. It was immediately suppressed, and as far as, as is known, it was never printed, and no manuscript copy of it survives, although clearly a copy of it was originally part of Bacon's collection of manuscripts, which has since been removed by accident or design. Following the performance of this seditious drama, the theatres were closed after the Privy Council received information that a lewd play containing seditious and slanderous matter was being performed on the bank side. From the little we know of the play, it apparently criticised government policy and abuses of state. The following investigation by the governing officials resulted in several players and one of the apparent makers of the play being thrown into prison. Its supposed author, Nash, fled to Yarmouth, but not without leaving incriminating papers at his lodgings. The state authorities were most interested in who was behind its authorship. It seems that the three players, Johnson, Spencer and Shaw, were not forthcoming, and on the 8th of October, a warrant was delivered for their release from prison. The important question of its authorship has never been satisfactorily settled. By his own account, Nash insists he only penned the first act. At the same time, he maintained that a further four acts were, without his consent, supplied by the players, rather than perhaps saying they were written by them. But at this distance, we cannot even be sure whether Nash possessed any knowledge of who supplied or penned the other four acts. It has long been known to some Baconian scholars that Thomas Nash was one of Bacon's literary masks, which has been extensively shown by both E.G. Harmon and W.S. Melson, and the suppressed play Isle of Dogs, which originally formed part of the Bacon Shakespeare manuscript, originated from the pen of Bacon. The Bacon Shakespeare Manuscript, formerly known as the Northumberland Manuscript, originally held copies of Bacon's Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. In addition to having held his two Shakespeare plays, the outer cover of his collection of manuscripts contains references and links to his narrative Shakespeare poem, The Rape of Lucrece, and another three of his Shakespeare plays, Love Labour's Lost, Romeo and Juliet, and The Merchant of Venice. This is moreover the only manuscript where the names Bacon and Shakespeare appear together in a contemporary document. Various forms of the name Bacon and Francis Bacon and his pseudonym Shakespeare and William Shakespeare have been scribbled across its outer cover on around 20 occasions. Alongside the entries and links to these Shakespeare plays in the entry for the Isle of Dogs is the entry for the Isle of Dogs, a play written by Bacon Shakespeare, in which Ben Jonson was one of the actors in the performance of it at the Swan Theatre in July 1597. In 1598, Ben Jonson wrote his first play, Every Man in His Humour, which was performed by the Lord Chamberlain's Men, the company to whom Bacon supplied many of his Shakespeare plays, with one of its parts, so it is said, performed by the actor William Shakespeare of Stratford. Jonson soon after wrote a sequel to it entitled Every Man Out of His Humour in 1599, which was also acted by the Lord Chamberlain's Men. This was entered in the Stationer's Register on the 8th of April 1600 by its publisher William Holm as a comical satire of every man out of his humour. Its first quarter edition was issued by Holm in 1600 with the following title page.
The biting satire, Every Man Out of His Humour, was being written by Ben Jonson around the same time John Shaxper and his heirs, including his son William Shaxper of Stratford, was being granted a heraldic family coat of arms in 1599, thereby acquiring the status of gentleman. The coat of arms is adorned with the motto non sans droit, meaning not without right, an event and motto pointedly alluded to by Ben Jonson in Every Man Out of His Humour, who was even then already clearly aware that William Shakespeare of Stratford was a literary mass for Francis Bacon, the secret concealed author of the Shakespeare works. In Every Man Out of His Humour, the actor William Shakespeare is caricatured in the form of a character named Sodliado, who is described in the introduction below the names of the actors as an essential clown, brother to Sordido, yet so enamoured of the name of a gentleman that he will have it, though he buys it. He comes up every term to learn to take tobacco and see new motions. He is in his kingdom when he can get himself into company where he may be laughed at. A clown is an unsophisticated country person, a rustic or a semi-illiterate bumpkin, uneducated, not well-read and stupid. The name Sogliardo is Italian for filth. In Florio's Italian dictionary, the definition of Sogliardo is given as a mocker, scoffer, quipper, flouter, prankster, jester, also slovenly, sluttish, hoggish, also a lubbard or loggerhead, a gulf fool, flatterer, a cogger. A cogger being a cheat or deceiver, a false person, somebody who is not what he seems. In the play, the characters discuss Sogliardo's newly acquired heraldic crest. Sogliardo, Shakespeare, says to Puntavolo, Bacon, Marry, sir, it is your boar without a head rampant. A boar without a head, that's very rare. The crest of the actor William Shakespeare of Strat Stratford was not a headless boar. On the Shakespeare coat of arms is the motto non sans droit, not without right, regarding which Puntavolo Bacon hits on when saying Sogliardo's motto should be not without mustard. This is a clever use of wordplay by Johnson in more ways than one. Mustard is eaten with pork or bacon, which are both derived from a boar or swine, with its associated terms of hog, pig or porker. To repeatedly reinforce the allusion to bacon in the above passage, the word boar or swine is utilised five times, and then there is the reference to hog's cheek, again from which bacon is obtained, quickly followed by the line, a frying pan to the crest, in which bacon is cooked, a possible allusion to bacon's maternal cook family lineage. In the passage, Sogliardo's crest is described as a boar rampant without a head. The inference is the actor Shakespeare, alias Sogliardo, is, as Carlo says, a swine without a head, without brain, wit, anything indeed, rampant to gentility. Bacon's crest was a boar, indicating that William Shakespeare is Francis Bacon, without the head and the brains. In, an, in other words, Shakespeare, alias Sogliardo, an un uneducated, semi-illiterate, false deceiver, was a literary front for Bacon. To make the illusion clearer, Johnson puts in the mouth of Shakespeare, alias Sogliardo, Marry, sir, it is your boar without a head. Once more repeating the illusion that Bacon, whose crest is a boar, is the concealed poet and dramatist Shakespeare. In Act 5, Scene 2, Sogliardo is set on to masquerade as a gentleman of the highest quality to court Lady Saviolina. She is informed that this mysterious gentleman is like no other that her ladyship has hitherto laid eyes on and that he is a kinsman of Justice Silence. He is described to her by Puntavolo in terms consistent with contemporary descriptions of Bacon himself, which of course Ben was more than familiar with. Interestingly, Puntavolo is shortened in the play to Punt, and Punt has the same numerical value in simple cipher as Francis, 67.
further confirmation that Puntavolo represented Bacon appeared in the 1616 folio edition of the works of Benjamin Johnson, in which the lines of this speech providing the above description of the gentleman were very carefully formatted and printed to incorporate an anagram. P-O-E-T-C-A-N-B-O-F, which rearranged gives us F. Bacon, poet, conveying the cryptic message that the actor William Shakespeare of Stratford was a front or literary mask for Francis Bacon, whom Johnson secretly knew was the concealed hidden author of the Shakespeare works. In or around the year that saw the publication of Every Man Out of His Humour, Ben Jonson wrote another satirical play called Poetaster, which was first performed in 1601. It was entered in the Stationers' Register by its publisher Matthew Lowndes on the 21st of December 1601 and set forth in quarter edition in early 1602. It is set in ancient Rome, whose characters include Ovid, praised as Shakespeare's favourite poet, whose writings likewise colour Bacon's own and knowledge works, Virgil, whose early translations into English were dedicated to Sir Nicholas Bacon, whom Bacon described in his advancement as the best poet, and Horace, an early English translation of whose writings were dedicated to Lady Anne Cook Bacon. In Poetaster, there is also a character called Ovid Jr., a student lawyer who secretly writes poems and plays. He is attended by a servant named Luscus, who wears buskins, i.e. actors' boots. The first scene opens with Ovid Jr. busy writing his poetry. Young master, master Ovid, do you hear? Gods are me, away with your songs and sonnets, and on with your gown and cap. Quickly, hear, hear, your father will be a man of this room presently. How near's my father? Heart a man, get a law book in your hand. I will not answer you else. This villainous poetry will undo you by the welkin. What? Hast thou buskins on, Luscus, that thou swearest so tragically and high? With Ovid Senior approaching, Ovid Junior teasingly asks Luscus to read over his elegy before his father arrives. In a fluster, Luscus castigates him for his lunacy and madness in never being able to stop writing his poetry, leaving him to his poetical fancies and furies. In the lines that follow, Ben includes the Latin couplet from Ovid's Amores, which is printed on the title page of the Shakespeare poem Venus and Adonis as an epigraph, which, in the persona of Ovid Jr., he translates as Neil Hines to Trash, me let bright Phoebus swell, with cups full flowing from the Muses' well. It is clear Ben Jonson is portraying Bacon behind the character of Ovid Jr., whom he insinuates is the concealed author of the Shakespeare poem Venus and Adonis. And just as he coupled Puntavolo, Bacon Shakespeare, with the uneducated, unread and deceitful Sogliardo, Shakespeare of Stratford, in Every Man Out of His Humour, in Poetaster, he couples him with Luscus, Shakespeare of Stratford, presented as an actor or someone masquerading as an actor. In the play, Luscus is told that he belongs among the ostlers, someone who is employed to look after horses at an inn, the occupation, according to tradition, of William Shakespeare of Stratford when he first arrived in London, where, where he attended horses outside the playhouse. In Act 1, Scene 2, Ovid Senior arrives and severely chastises his son. Ovid, whom I thought to see the pleader, become Ovid the playmaker. I hear of a tragedy of yours coming forth for the common players there, called Medea. What shall I have my son a stager now? The secret poet and dramatist Ovid Jr. Bacon tries to assuage his father, Ovid Sr., by telling him the reports are untrue, that he is not known upon the stage, nor is he involved in the theatres, even though, as we know, he writes plays, including the Medea, for the players, meaning that he was not known as a writer for the stage under his own name. They wrong me, sir, and do abuse you more that blow your ears with these untrue reports. I am not known unto the open stage, nor do I traffic in their theatres. The insinuation being that Francis Bacon, alias Ovid Jr., was writing for the stage in secret. 
hidden behind the pseudonym or literary mask of William Shakespeare of Stratford, alias Luscus, a hired lackey, who Ben Jonson tells us had no interest in poetry or drama, whose natural home was among the ostlers and tapsters. On the 4th of September 1605, Ben Jonson's Eastwood Ho was entered in the Stationer's Register by William Aspley and Thomas Thorpe, with three-quarter editions of the play printed by G. Eld, published by Aspley within three months of each other in the same year. The play, written in collaboration with George Chapman and John Marston, who a few years earlier threw a series of satirical works with Joseph Hall, issued from 1597 to 1599, cryptically revealed that Bacon was the hidden author of the Shakespeare poems Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucretia, with Johnson also privy to their secret Baconian authorship. Of the plays by Ben Jonson, this masterpiece of parody, Eastwood Ho, written in collaboration with Chapman and Marston, has down the centuries received considerably less critical attention from orthodox critics and commentators, and regrettably nor has it hitherto attracted the notice of any Baconian scholars. In this play, Johnson, along with his collaborators, revealed that Bacon is the concealed author of the Shakespeare plays, many of which they openly and deliber deliberately parody, refer and allude to, wherein the chosen name of its key character is Francis Quicksilver. The Christian name of Francis Bacon and Quicksilver, another term for Mercury, messenger of the gods, known for eloquence and communication. In the play, the father of Francis Quicksilver is named Touchstone, the name of the clown in As You Like It, and his mother, Mistress Touchstone, with his two sisters called Gertrude, the name of Hamlet's mother, and Mildred, the Christian name of his aunt, Lady Mildred Cook Cecil, elder sister of Lady Anne Cook Bacon. And just for good measure, with surpassing wit, Ben Jonson gives one of the other characters the name and title Hamlet, a footman. A waiting woman is designated Betris, a variant of Beatrice, one of the central characters in Much Ado About Nothing, and there is also Mistress Fond, a play on the name of Mistress Alice Ford from The Merry Wives of Windsor. There is also a part for a drawer who serves drinks at the Blue Anchor Tavern, reminiscent of the drawer named Francis in 1 Henry IV. There is also the character Slitgut, a butcher's apprentice, in reference to William Shakespeare of Stratford, whose father, among other trades, was a butcher. Self-evidently, Johnson are also familiar with Bacon's simple cipher system. The name Slitgut provides a numerical count of 103 in simple cipher, the same count for Shakespeare. Thus, Ben Jonson cryptically insinuates through Bacon's simple cipher system that William Shakespeare, alias Slitgut, is a literary mask for the true author of the Shakespeare works, Francis Bacon. The satire Eastwood Ho also parodies numerous Shakespeare plays, among them Richard III, Hamlet, Henry IV, Henry V, As You Like It, and possibly alludes to Twelfth Night and All's Well That Ends Well. There are, writes Professor Taylor, clear parallels of Hamlet and Richard III in Eastwood Ho. Indeed, the whole play from title to epilogue is a masterpiece of parody. And in the case of Hamlet and Richard III, it is laid on with a trowel. For Strittmatter and Kozitsky, it also parodies King Lear, or alternatively, believing the direction of influence travelled travel the other way, Professor Taylor observes that the two plays share parallels of structure, subject matter and verbal detail. There is no doubt Eastwood Ho is preoccupied, obsessed even, with the Shakespeare plays. And, as we will see, its cleverly interwoven subtext is preoccupied with their secret concealed author, whose central character, Francis Quicksilver, whose motto is Eastwood Ho, is a disguised, complex, silhouetted mask of Francis Bacon, who Ben Jonson repeatedly tells those with eyes to see is the author of the Shakespeare works. Act 1, Scene 1 of Eastwood Ho opens with Master William Touchstone, a London goldsmith, and his son Francis Quicksilver, warning him against dissolute and dishonest company. 
Francis Quicksilver responds by saying that his mother is a gentlewoman and his father a justice of the peace, which fit Touchstone and his wife, Mistress Touchstone, yet also fits with an allusion to Francis Bacon's mother, Lady Anne Cook Bacon, and his father, the great man of the law, Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper and de facto Lord Chancellor of England. Francis Quicksilver describes himself as a younger brother, and Francis Bacon too was younger brother to Anthony Bacon. He admits he's entertained among gallants. They call me Cousin Frank, right? Which he repeats twice more in quick succession. In his youth, Francis Bacon was educated at Gorhambury by his mother, Lady Bacon, alongside his elder brother, Anthony, and Anne Gresham, Gresham Bacon, the young wife of his half-brother, Sir Nathaniel Bacon. In gratitude, Anne Gresham Bacon wrote to Lady Bacon, thanking her for their shared lessons as well as sending warm wishes to my brother Anthony and my good brother Frank. Following on from the gallants who call him Cousin Frank, Francis Quicksilver says, I lend them monies, good, they spend it well, but when they are spent, must not they strive for more, must not their land fly? This is an in-joke on Bacon's loathing of moneylenders and loan sharks to whom, with his brother Anthony Bacon, he was forever in debt as they were busy producing many works from their scriptorium. In Trinity term 1597, a goldsmith named Simpson of Lombard Street, who held a bond for £300 principal, sued Bacon for repayment, but agreed to respite the satisfaction of it until the beginning of the following term. However, without any warning, before Michaelmas term commenced, Bacon was walking from the Tower of London when, at the instigation of the moneylender Simpson, he was served with an execution and arrested with a view to confining him to the Fleet Prison. The events were to inform and colour the most famous legal play in the history of English drama, The Merchant of Venice, whose titular character is named Antonio, the Italian form of Antony, named after and modelled upon Anthony Bacon, a play which revolves around the relationship between the merchant Antonio and the Venetian Lord Bassanio, Francis Bacon, that mirrors the complex relationship and circumstances of Francis and Anthony Bacon before, during and after the play was first written, revised and performed. The portrayal of Francis Quicksilver as the son of a goldsmith and sometime moneylender is just an outward characterisation. As Professor Gary Taylor points out, Quicksilver's mercurial nature is the dramatic embodiment of his very name which in turn is part of a larger pattern of alchemical illusions structuring the entire play. Or, as Oliphant observes, Francis Quicksilver is hopelessly inconsistent. He changes his character with almost every appearance. He is a veritable chameleon with a different face and name for every occasion, a disguised concealed author who spends his days at the theatre. He reveals his familiar familiarity with the drama by readily quoting from the Spanish tragedy Tamburlaine, whose true authorship Ben Jonson was also aware of, and Henry IV, in a play whose central character, Francis Quicksilver, is a disguised characterisation of concealed poet and dramatist Francis Bacon, that parodies, refers or alludes to at least eight of his Shakespeare plays, Hamlet, Richard III, Henry V, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, All's Well That Ends Well, The Merchant of Venice and Henry IV. For his earlier misdemeanours in the outward role given to him by Ben Jonson, Francis Quicksilver is arrested and imprisoned for theft and sentenced to death. In prison, the contrite Quicksilver sings a poignant and revealing song of repentance. In the song, Francis Quicksilver begins one of its verses with Still Eastwood Ho was all my word, insinuating Eastwood Ho was all about him or all about Francis Bacon, immediately followed by three lines which taken together contains a hidden anagram of Bacon. Ben Jonson, a well-known lover of anagrams, also introduces another anagram, this time of F. Bacon, in a song delivered by Francis Quicksilver's cohort Security, an old usurer.
In further penance, Quicksilver insists on walking through the streets of London dressed in rags as a spectacle or rather an example in an act of humility before the children of Cheapside. He then delivers the epilogue of Eastwood Ho. He sees that the people of London have gathered to watch them leave the prison as if it was some kind of theatrical pageant or the closing of a play at the theatre. In the dramatic disguise of his character Francis Quicksilver, he addresses the audience. He wants them to come to see the show or the play once a week rather than being drawn to a pageant once a year. It is clear from the epilogue that Ben Johnson is very familiar with Bacon's simple cipher system as it incorporates several concealed Baconian ciphers. The first and last lines of the verse comprise of 33 letters, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. The verse itself contains 33 italic words, again Bacon in simple cipher. It clearly has a cryptographic Baconian subtext that is all leading to a grand denouement. The whole verse contains 35 words and 138 letters. 138 minus 35 equals 103 Shakespearean simple cipher. Thus we have Ben Johnson cryptographically confirming for those with eyes to see that Bacon is Shakespeare. Towards the end of the first decade of the 17th century, Ben Jonson began to assemble his first book of epigrams, two of which are of particular interest to Baconians. The collection was entered in the Stationers' Register by John Stepneth on the 15th of March 1612 as a book called Ben Jonson, His Epigrams. This was the last entry by Stepneth in the Stationers' Register and he died sometime later the same year. The epigrams first appeared in the folio edition entitled The Works of Benjamin Johnson, printed by William Stansby in 1616. The epigrams are dedicated to William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, then Grand Warden, serving under Grand Master of England Inigo Jones, to whom Bacon dedicated with his brother Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, the Shakespeare first folio. For when I made them, I had nothing in my conscience to expressing of which I did need a cipher. Following the dedication to the soon-to-be Grand Master of England, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, in a brief two-line address to the reader, Johnson delivers a pregnant directive. Pray thee, take care that takest my book in hand, to read it well, that is, to understand. In the dedication, with subtle ambiguity, Ben hints at the use of ciphers and in the address to the reader he is immediately at pains to encourage his intelligent and observant readers to look very closely at what they read. In other words, for those able to pierce the veil if they look very closely, they will discern he has made use of certain Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers he is clearly familiar with to reveal a profound historical secret about Bacon and the Shakespeare works. In a witty and ingenious epigram addressed to someone Johnson conceals behind the pseudonym Cheverell, a lawyer, who is familiar with Johnson's earlier plays, wherein Johnson pointedly alludes to Bacon and his literary mask William Shakespeare of Stratford, has jokingly threatened Ben with the Star Chamber and the Bar. The learned Johnson prided himself on his mastery of language, and the word or name chosen for the pseudonym to conceal its target was itself masterful. The word chevrel means soft leather made from kid skin, used as a symbol of flexibility, the ability to change one's face or name. The epigram contains a ciphered message, one its recipient will readily be able to decipher and read, wherein Ben repeats that Francis Bacon is the secret author of the Shakespeare works. For the title of the ep epigram, On Chevril, Johnson has very deliberately omitted the E for the purposes of a cipher, which conceals and reveals just who is meant by Chevril the lawyer. On Chevril is a hundred in simple cipher, the same numerical value as Francis Bacon. The epigram is then addressed to Francis Bacon, alias Chevril. However, this was just the start of the secret cryptographic message. In the epigram, there are two words printed in block capitals and one word printed in italics. When the hundred representing Francis Bacon is added to the differently printed three words, it gives us a total of 103, which is Shakespeare in simple cipher. 
Still Ben is not yet finished and just for good measure he cryptically insinuates into the epigram another piece of secret information. He's ensured that the epigram is numbered 54. When the number 54 is added to the 103, it provides a total of 157, the secret signature for Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. Thus, when the enciphered cryptogram is converted to clear text, it reads, Francis Bacon, brother of the Rosy Cross, is Shakespeare. There is also a second epigram addressed by Ben Johnson to Chevrolet the lawyer, which incorporates another anagram of F. Bacon. The word grease, with its obvious association with a pig from whence bacon is derived, should have been something of a giveaway, with it being a clear allusion to bacon. The definition of a greased pig is, nobody can catch or stop them, or they are so slippery few can ident identify them. But Ben Johnson knows who he is and he has left posterity the means to identify him via the above anagram spelling out F. Bacon. Furthermore, it will be observed that each of the last two lines contain 39 letters, which is also F. Bacon in simple cipher, a count introduced for the purposes of reinforcing the F. Bacon anagram, again illustrating that Johnson was familiar with Bacon's simple cipher system. In what was only one of three mentions of Ben Jonson in Spedding's monumental seven-volume, 3,000-page The Letters and Life of Francis Bacon, with a carefully selected theatrical metaphor, Spedding knowingly cryptically foreshadows the key secret relationship between Bacon and Jonson, the fullness of which has remained hidden to the pages of history for 400 years. Ben Jonson, who had seen something of him off the stage, though we do not know how much, the intense depth of their relationship in the later stages can be gauged from the revealing verse written by Johnson to celebrate Bacon's 16th birthday on the 22nd of January 1621 at York House, in lines as Spedding puts it, breathing of nothing but reverence and honour, hailing him a happy genius who stands as if some mystery thou didst, before raising Bacon to the wisdom of my king. Following Bacon's fall, in an astonishing letter written to his trusted inward friend, the Spanish ambassador Count Gondomar, dated 6 of June 1621, Bacon explicitly states that he was to devote himself to the instruction of the actors in reference to his plans for the preparation and publication of the Shakespeare First Folio and the service of future ages. Your Excellency's love towards me I have found ever warm and sincere, alike in prosperity and adversity, for which I give you due thanks. But for myself, my age, my fortune, yea, my genius, to which I have hitherto done but scant justice, calls me now to retire from the stage of civil action and betake myself to letters and to the instruction of the actors themselves and the service of posterity. In the last five years of his recorded life, Bacon wrote, revised, expanded, translated and published an enormous body of his writings and works in Latin and English. This was carried out in his literary workshop at Gorhambury with the help of his good pens, including the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, who assisted Bacon in translating his essays, previously printed and published by William and John Jaggard into Latin. The Latin translation of them were a work performed by diverse hands by those of Dr Hackett, late Bishop of Lichfield, Mr Benjamin Johnson, the learned and judicious poet, and some others whose names I once heard from Dr Rawley, but I cannot now recall them. With Ben Johnson now living at Gorhambury, Bacon was busy gathering together from various manuscripts and printed sources all of his Shakespeare plays for publication in what is known as the first folio of the Shakespeare works. In a letter to Toby Matthew in the June of 1623, when the Shakespeare first folio was then making its way through the Jaggard family printing presses, Bacon informed him, 
It is true my labours are now most set to have those works which I had formerly published, as that of Advancement of Learning, that of Henry the Seventh, that of the Essays being retractate and made more perfect, well translated into Latin by the help of some good pens which forsake me not. In the first English life of Bacon, its author, Dr. William Rawley, Bacon's private secretary and fellow Rosicrucian brother, who lived with Bacon for the last decade of his recorded life, states that he spent the last five years employed in writing, revising and translating his acknowledged works, for which he is still famous. Before revealing, he wished to die in the shadow and not the light, a transparent coded reference to his shadowy secret authorship of the Shakespeare works. The last five years of his life being withdrawn from civil affairs and from active life, he employed wholly in contemplation and studies, a thing whereof his lordship would often speak during his active life, as if he affected to die in the shadow and not the light. Contrary to common knowledge and an uncomfortable truth for orthodox Shakespeare commentators, it is clear that Francis Bacon and Ben Jonson had a very close personal and professional friendship. And it was with the assistance of his fellow Rosicrucian brother Ben Jonson that Francis Bacon, the great poet philosopher and dramatist, finally brought to fruition the monumental 1623 Shakespeare First Folio, the mo most unique work of its kind in the world.